Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the student lecture that's part of the I Good and Come lecture series. Uh, this is the uh, family of I Good and Cohen, who was a very prominent trial lawyer in Michigan and very much believed in trial. And the purpose of this lecture is to bring an expert here, uh, lawyers, judges, practitioners, law professors, to give a lecture on a part of the trial practice. I'd like to introduce to you Ina Cohen, who is one of our graduates, and her brother Dennis, who has come in from California every year for the lecture. There will be another, the public lecture will be this evening, and again, it's on a different uh, topic of evidence and practice. To introduce our speaker, I'm going to ask Professor Beecher Monis, who has known our speaker for quite some time, and is responsible for her being here. So, may I ask you to introduce? Do 
jury judge between two statements, each founded on an experience which is confessedly foreign to their own. This is setting the jury to decide where doctors disagree. So in hand in 1901, he found the solution was called appointed experts. He had no idea how tricky that would be. Um, I should tell you this, this lecture was actually written at the invitation of a bunch of Italians. So in part I'm trying to explain what we have been through, right? what we've tried, and whether it has worked, because it's very difficult. Yeah. Look at the back of the ABA journal. You will see this extraordinary list of advertisements for experts of various <coughs> descriptions. I won't read it to you, you can read it. Um, the whole point is to give you some sense of the variety of experts. And actually, these are rather specialized. They tend to focus on the medical, but there are all, all kinds of other this isn't enough to indicate the sheer number, the sheer variety of the kinds of expertise on which the legal system calls. In just about every kind of case, criminal cases, torts, immigration cases, fraud cases, estate cases, constitutional cases, practically every kind of case. Um, here's the plan. Try to explain why expert witnesses are a problem. To sketch the very complicated legal history of efforts in this country to control the quality of expert testimony, suggest what the limited success of those efforts teaches us going forward. An hour, eek, okay. Um, I think experts pose from an epistemological point of view is a perfect epistemological storm. It's the worst case scenario of trying to decide what to do it. Cool, I'm sorry about this word, it's horribly ugly. It just means theory of knowledge, but it has the great advantage you can make an adjective of it. You can try saying theory of knowledge, knowledge of it. It's a positive. So we have to use it as a posh word. Core question is how to assess the word of evidence. Now you see I got how I got drug into the law, which includes how to assess the credibility of what somebody else tells you, which includes how to assess the credibility of what an expert tells you, which in turn includes how to assess the credibility of what an expert tells you in a legal context. Now you start to see why figuring out what experts believe is so hard. There's this whole nexus of problems all meeting at the crossing point of the expert witness in the court. First, determining whether or to what degree it's reasonable to believe what someone else tells you always involves reliance on surrogate indicators of his truthfulness and his competence. It's always in direct. Think about asking for directions. This is, of course, a British roundabout. Um, oh, yeah. Oops, no, I said I was sorry. Think about asking for directions. You don't just believe what you're told. There are indicators that this person may not know what they're talking about. There are indicators that they may not be telling you the truth. I remember once in Krakow being sent back to my hotel alone in a tram. In a strange city, I don't speak a word of the language. <laughs> and my host said to me, oh, just get on the tram, get on the fifth, no, the sixth, no, fifth stop, no, I think it's the sixth stop. You can imagine, that was terrifying. I found my way. <coughs> That's already different. Determining whether it's reasonable to believe what an expert tells you is even more indirect, and so it's even more difficult because the necessary indicators are harder to identify. Whether, whether it's reasonable to believe what somebody says in court involves further complications because you might 
for example, be testifying in return to review on his own case, or he might be testifying on the basis of what is lined up that wasn't kosher, or he might previously identify somebody else as the perpetrator, or you can think of a million things. And determining whether it's reasonable to believe what an expert witness says in court is even harder because there's likely to be competing expert testimony on the other side, which a lay jury may only partly understand. And experts who have been prepared, of course, so as not to volunteer information that's potentially damaging. And moreover, if you're a juror and you're dealing with some horribly injured person, for example, your judgment may itself be impaired by this emotional impact. In short, we've got a perfect epistemological storm. Why is it hard to find a picture of an epistemological storm without being too deep? It's no wonder the US legal system has struggled to find ways of ensuring that expert testimony actually helps rather than getting in the way. At the time Hand wrote, 1901, expert witnesses were identified as they are the exception to the opinion rule. They can give their opinion, nobody else can. Um, that has now relaxed somewhat. So what makes somebody an expert witness now is having specialized knowledge and skill or training beyond that of the average of Europe. The story begins, the story of traditional screening begins with the Fry rule. Um, you all know the Fry story, I won't tell you again. Does anybody not know the Fry story? I'm not getting any, anything. Does that mean nobody knows but nobody wants to raise their hand? <laughs> Everybody knows? No, everyone no. does not. Everybody is not. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Fry was accused of murdering a physician. He confessed. Um, folklore says, but I don't know if it's true, he confessed because he thought he'd get half the reward if he did. <laughs> God, I don't think that's why he thought that. But anyway, um, when he realized what he'd done, he withdrew the, defense, the confession. He went to court. His attorney had had him submit to a very, very primitive lie detector test. It just measured blood pressure, nothing else. It wasn't a polygraph, which he had passed. Um, and the question was whether this should be admissible. Um, the ruling was no, it should not be admissible. And here is the key part of the Fry ruling, which constitutes what's now called the Fry Rule. Just when a scientific principle of discovery crosses the line between the experiment and the demonstrative stages, it's difficult to define. Somewhere in this twilight zone, the evidential force of the principle must be recognized. And while courts will go a long way in admitting expert testimony to use from well-recognized scientific principles of discovery, the thing from which the deduction is made must be sufficiently established to have gained general acceptance in the field to which it belongs. The bit in italics is the Fry rule, although the part about sufficiently established to have gained is more often forgotten than remembered. Um, Michigan hasn't been a Fry state for a decade. Um, Florida was a Fry state for most of the time I lived in Florida. Middle of 2013, <coughs> changed its rule. Justice Van Olsen and Fry doesn't say when scientific crosses the line. He doesn't say how to identify the principle of discovery, how large a majority constitutes general acceptance, how to individuate field. What's one field? Nevertheless, I think it's clear that rule was conservative in intent. You keep out stuff that's too new. It defers to the judgment of people in the field. It talks about general acceptance in the field. It's also very manipulable, very flexible, because it's very easy to get general acceptance if the field is very small. Quite hard to get it if the field is very large. So you get pressure on the concept of the field. Flexibility, probably explained, 
and why, why around 1975, this was the accepted rule in the majority of US jurisdictions. As a rule about the admissibility of novel scientific testimony, for a while it was supposed to be a rule about lie detectors, and then, no, okay, it's about novel scientific testimony. That's the first stage. Second stage, federal rules of evidence passed in 1975. Section 7 is about opinion evidence. Rule 702 is about expert testimony, whether it's scientific or not, whether it's novel. And on its face, it seems very hospitable to the admissibility of expert testimony. We'll leave it there. It's an expert or whatever it is. What 702 said in 1975, I'll tell you how hard it is to get my students to understand. It was different in 1975. You don't understand now, but if you don't understand what the rules say then, you only read what it says now, it looks like it's something simple. It said, an expert qualified by specialized knowledge, education, skill, or training may testify in the form of opinion if his testimony would be helpful to the fact finder and is not otherwise legally excluded. That is all it said. It didn't mention crime, it didn't mention general acceptance. Did that mean Fry was dead, at least in the federal courts? Nobody knew. Everybody disagreed. Courts disagreed. Scholars disagreed. For example, in Barefoot, which is a kind of distressing death penalty case in 1983, the Supreme Court simply brushed aside the idea that psychiatric testimony, that a capital defendant would be dangerous in the future, should have been excluded. Even though the American Philosophic, the American Psychological Association said such predictions are wrong two times out of three. You'd be better off flipping a coin. That's not the point. Federal Rule 702 says if it's relevant, it's admissible. And it's certainly relevant. Justice White says to the Supreme Court, cross-examination could have dealt with the problems. Too bad it didn't. Too bad for Mr. Benefit, who was executed in 1984. But in Downing, which was a 1984 federal case, the Federal Appeals Court held that the lower court had erred in excluding a psychologist's testimony about when eyewitnesses can be mistaken, and that judges should screen for reliability as well as relevance. By the early 1990s, there was the usual pressure for talk reform. Peter Huber publishes a book called Galileo's Revenge. That is, of course, Galileo, not Peter Huber. Uh, there's a proposal by Vice President Dan Quayle to beef up Federal Law 702. So things were coming to a head, and the Supreme Court preempts all. Huber's book is terrible, by the way, just terrible. Okay. It's a legal history problem, but very influential, just the same. So the Supreme Court steps in and takes Dalbert versus Merrill Dalbert from the Supreme The civil case in which the lower courts had used Fry in excluding the plaintiff's experts. Very unusual. At the time, there were exactly three cases in which Fry had been used in a similar case, and Dalby was the cleanest of them. Clarifying the legal situation, no, no, clarifying the legal situation, Justice Blackman wrote for a unanimous Supreme Court, yup, Fry is dead federal. Courts were still screen out the testimony, however, and he goes on in a part only the majority agrees to, special screen for relevance and reliability. So it goes the way of Downing, not the way of Barefoot. So he quietly drops specialized or other technical from Rule 702. Watch for ellipses, guys. Ellipses mean 
He's taken something out, and he's taken something out that's going to come back to bite the Supreme Court. To be reliable, expert testimony must be scientific, dot, 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 knowledge. What makes a testimony scientific, he thinks, is it uses the scientific method. So the court should look not to expert witnesses' conclusions, but to their methodology. I am not endorsing this picture of the scientific method. I don't really believe in the scientific method. I think it's a myth. But Justice Blackman thought there was one. And ever since now, the experts have to have a methodology. Here are some indicia of evidential reliability, whether the theory can be and has been tested, whether it's been subjected to peer review and publication, no more potential error rate, whether it's gained widespread acceptance. That's a moment to fry. Spent way too much of my life deconstructing every one of these clauses. Of these downward factors, so-called, the first reflects Justice Blackwell's confusion of scientific with reliable. Is it obvious to everybody they mean different things? Not all scientific witnesses are reliable, and not all reliable witnesses are scientific. So it's a big muddle from the first step. And moreover, he's adopted Karl Popper's philosophy of science. Someone gets me started on Karl Popper, well, all right, but for now I will say I think he was one of the great philosophical frauds of the 20th century, <laughs> enormously influential, with a completely non viable philosophy of science. Second factor, which in part represents a seriously mistaken idea that peer reviewed publication is a sign of the widespread acceptance mentioned in the fall. It's not. Peer reviewed publication just means one or two referees thought this was interesting enough to be worth putting into the press. That's all it means. The third, which sort of sounds better, known or potential error rate, is much less helpful than it initially appears. It doesn't tell you what error rate's acceptable. Is two out of three acceptable? Like better? Or what? Supreme Court remands the case to the Ninth Circuit where Judge Kaczynski adds a fifth element factor, whether the work was litigation driven. But he made an important exception. It's just a little problem. Of course, this doesn't apply to forensic science. It's all litigation driven. That will come back to bite us too. In Dalbert, Justice Rehnquist had dissented Dissent is actually very funny. Justice Blackman's ruling requires judges, he says, to make scientific determinations for themselves. Indeed, it does. Fry defers this question. Now, it's fine. Also, Justice Rehnquist, they're not qualified for that. They're very intelligent, they're highly educated. I defer to no one, he says, in my respect for federal judges, but I have no idea what Justice Blackman is talking about talks about falsifiability, and I don't know anyone either. Moreover, he says, there is bound to be trouble about those non-scientific experts. What about the experts on the authenticity of artwork, or the experts on the design of motor tires or seatbelt buckles? Where do they fit? Sure enough, Shortly after constructing now, but the Supreme Court starts deconstructing it. It's quite impossible. The first thing we go is the distinction between methodology and conclusions. In Joyner, where the issue was, what's the standard of review for such decisions? The answer was abuse of discretion. And no, the law no court hadn't abused its discretion. He had worked as an electrician for the city of Georgia. The city of Georgia 
doesn't doesn't mean he changed the plugs. No. Or the light bulbs. No. He disassembled the new transformers, cleaned the parts, put them back together again. Uh, the transformers were insulated with oil, which was contaminated with PCBs. PCBs are carcinogenic as hell. Sometimes you know, smash them. Sometimes you bring some in. Occasionally he swallowed a girl, and he claimed this caused my lung cancer. The defendant said, but you smoked for eight years. Implicit in the 
earlier. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how often you say, reliably, reliably, enough, woo, woo. It's just ritual incantation. It doesn't help anybody decide what is reliable. It just makes them nervous. We've got to decide whether it's reliable, but we don't know how. Justice Breyer and others said, well, you know, there are solutions to this problem. How is a judge to determine whether expert testimony is reliable? We need more education for judges in scientific and uh, other expert topics. There have been three editions of the reference manual on scientific evidence. Are you familiar with this wreck of a book? Has anybody ever read it? I don't know. I haven't read every word. But it's sometimes very useful and it's sometimes really terrible. And of course, there are no red flags telling you which is which. There have been various programs offering scientific education for judges. There was one famous one early in this century, um, educating judges about DNA. They were actually fooling with the stuff in test tubes. And I remember the report which said the judges say, wow, <laughs> you can actually draw this stuff out of the test tube. It worries me. But the idea that in a weekend you can teach a judge enough about DNA to determine whether or not the testimony being produced in court is likely reliable, that's dangerous. A little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Justice Breyer thought the solution is called upon the experts. Just like Judge Learned Hand did in 1901. I like that. In 1901, Judge Learned Hand suggests this. 1999, Justice Breyer comes around to, well, you know, they should use their power to appoint their own experts. Um, this has proven a lot less straightforward than he imagined. The most famous example, well, there are many, but the most famous example probably is Judge Samuel Pointer's National Science on silicon breast implants. Four scientists appointed by Judge Pointer, who went to a great deal of trouble to select these experts at arm's length. He didn't select them. He had a panel of people to select them. I was lucky enough to know someone who was a member of this panel, and she was actually very funny about this process. So I could get experts to advise the judge on this testimony. <coughs> and she said, you know, we sent out this conflict of interest form to all these, all these potential scientific experts. You know, scientists are so stupid they don't understand conflict of interest. So what do you mean? Well, one of them actually called me up, she said, and asked, said, look, my wife has silicon breast implants. Is that a conflict of interest? Oh my goodness, no clue. Um, and it went so far that when the panel members, after they reported, they reported we don't think there's any evidence that these implants cause the diseases they're alleged to. After they reported, they reported they were of course deposed by the plaintiffs at home. And the plaintiffs' attorneys discovered all kinds of connections between them and people who worked for the defendant companies. Um, the worst of them, oh dear, was Dr. Tugwell. Heaven help us. Um, he would be Canadian. Um, he had to be a Canadian because the American Society of Rheumatologists already had an official position on this matter. So no American was qualified. They were already took the position. While he was serving on the panel, he wrote a letter to one of the defendant companies asking for money to support a conference. The whole thing then he fell apart over this because the plaintiffs' attorneys were naturally not happy and they wanted the panel dismissed. Judge Pointer managed to save it and the settlement was arranged. But what this tells you is appointing a panel of neutral experts is not easy, not a trivial matter at all. So you can hear what a neutral expert is, or I'm not entirely clear that that's quite what we want, but that's what we're talking about. The same year, 
that Judge Jones appointed his own panel to deal with the smaller number of these cases that Pointer had sent back to him. And it was much less scandalous. It was a lot cheaper. It was less fanfare. There was no bad publicity. But when you look closely at what happened, who helped him pick the experts? His cousin. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's not only not only scientists who don't understand about conflict of interest. As we've also learned occasionally, called upon your experts disagree among themselves. Of course they do. If the science is cutting edge, nobody knows. And it's to be expected for experts to disagree. So sometimes judges find they have to override their own experts. So this is not a panacea. Well, of late, we, okay, once Kuhn and I would know that the Supreme Court hasn't returned to the general question of expert testimony, but it has returned to the question of forensic testimony in the context of confrontation clause cases. Uh, probably because doubt has had very little effect in criminal cases. Had a big effect in civil cases, very little in criminal cases, where one might have hoped it would do something desirable, like keep really crappy forensic testimony out. It's not happened. Um, probably in some class you'll be asked to study the raft of cases challenging fingerprint testimony under Dalbert. Okay. And time after time after time after time, the challenge is denied. When the Supreme Court turns its attention to forensic evidence, it's in a constitutional context. Mainly, it's about the implications of the confrontation clause for forensic evidence. It's basically all about the potential role of cross-examination. First of these cases is Melendez. The majority argues in a nice, simple ruling, in, I think, cynical enough to think, it sounds that simple, it's probably going to get more complicated before long. It's the same importance. Um, the majority, Mr. Melendez Diaz, who was accused of drug dealing, had the constitutional right to have the analysts who determined that the substance that seized from him was cocaine appear in court to be cross-examined. You can't have them just send in a report. They have to show up. They have to be cross-examined. The dissenters said, oh my God, what have we just done? Um, forensic labs across the country are already overworked, and now we're going to have forensic scientists flying from the lab to go to court, and they won't be getting on with their real work. I had this mental picture. You know that, that advertisement that we're in? It seems like the olden days now. Um, United Airlines used to talk about the friendly skies of United. And I, I had this mental picture of forensic experts flying all over the country and crashing into each other because they had to appear in court because they'd done the analysis that was <coughs> crucial to this guy's conviction. That's what the dissenters seem to be worried about, that this was just going to disrupt the entire forensic system. The next case down the line was Walker, which was about blood alcohol. Um, Mr. Walker was involved in a car accident. He was, as we British say, as pissed as a mute. He was really, really drunk. Um, the plurality rules in line with Melendez, yes. But the analyst who actually filled out the blood alcohol report must show up. It's not enough to have the supervisor of the lab say, oh, the alcohol procedures and everything always works fine. There's nothing to worry about. The guy who actually did it has to show up. The guy who actually did it had left the laboratory 
for reasons which are unknown. Okay. Nobody knows about this left. Was he incompetent? Was he dishonest? Who knows? Nobody knows. The dissenters said, what the difference would it have made if he showed up? But think about what the test was. You stick a sample of, of Mr. Bull coming blood in the machine. You press the button and you go home for the night. And when you come back in the morning, it's back out of the report. But why do we need the guy who pressed the button? What good would it do? But they lost. Now I'm completely confused. In Williams, in 2012, <coughs> Supreme Court does a U-turn. Um, in an unbelievably confusing plurality ruling, I think you're the only people who are confused by plurality rulings. I can assure you, you are not. I am desperately confused by Williams. Um, I can remember making a really foolish promise to my students, okay, we'll talk about this next week. And by the night before the class, I was up late, sweating bullets, going, what the heck? You know, I finally made a diagram, and finally got to the head of the what the plurality concludes for a whole bunch of different reasons, I wouldn't want to be a lower court judge trying to figure this out, is that when the expert witness referred to this DNA profile, the rape case, <coughs> as having been produced from the victim's spot, she wasn't testifying to the truth of this. And so she didn't trigger the requirement of the technician from Selmark again. It was just, I think, okay, they produced this report, and it said this DNA profile was produced from the victim's fault. She was not testifying as to the truth of this. And therefore, there was no need for the technician from Selmark, who actually did the test, to show up. You understand? Selmark produces the profile from the victim's fault. She has that profile and the DNA from Mr. Williams, and she testifies that there's a match. But that there's a match is of no significance, unless the sample is the one from crime, otherwise it's irrelevant. The dissenters focus this time on the power of cross-examination to reveal mistakes, incompetence, dishonesty. Justice Kagan, who writes the dissent, begins with a very disturbing story. Um, actually, this, this dissent is Remarkable. I now now use it as a sort of uh, model for my students. You want to get the audience's attention, tell them a story first. Open with a story. Open with a story. That will get their attention. Open with a good story and you've tossed the battle. Well, she opens with this very, very disturbing story. Forensic scientist shows up, testifies about the DNA match with perfect confidence, and is then cross-examined, and she survives that well enough, and then as she's leaving the stand, goes, oh, shit, oh, my God, I just realized what happened. I switched the labels on the DNA samples. This isn't from the defendant, this is from the victim. Oh, my God. Well, that's very disturbing, and it does indeed suggest that maybe cross-examination is doing something very significant here, because it was what, for what prompted her to own up who made a mistake. I, I have great admiration for this woman, I have to say, because she just plain, clearly said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's deeply embarrassing, but I didn't do it. It's not insignificant, I think, that the case that 
Justice Kagan came up with was actually many years old. It's not that there are scans of these. We go back a good few years to find it. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, well, we got lucky this time. There was competent cross-examination that got this mistake into the open. But wouldn't it have been better if the labs didn't make these mistakes in the first place? Wouldn't that be the ideal? If the labs were better run so that this kind of thing happened less often? Which turns me to the next stage of our struggles with expert testimony. There's a very similar thought behind a report produced by the National Research Council and the National Academy of Sciences in 2009, strengthening forensic science in the United States. Um, some of it makes me roll my eyes. You know, we, want more, we want more federal money, it says, every five pages. Scientists always say we need more research and we need more federal money. They always say that. So I roll my eyes a bit. But besides those predictable calls, there is a lot of good sense about what goes wrong in forensic labs and how we might run them better. A lot of common sense about human error, confirmation bias, what precautions we might take to prevent this. Um, 2009, I was going to go, okay, we might be making progress. Ah. Um, 2015, I go check. What exactly has happened as a result of this report? Well, all kinds of meetings have been held. All kinds of commissions have been set up to try to improve this. Right? What's actually happened? Zip. It's <laughs> uh, very disappointing. I actually found one, one committee that looked really promising right in the beginning. We're going to get moving on this. What happened? Um, as of the last time I checked, they just held their sixth planning meeting. But nothing had actually even been recommended. They were still planning how to hold meetings to hold meetings to um, the Sounds like a good faculty. <laughs> trying to say to the Italians, what have we learned from, ever since 1923, we've been struggling with this. It's been nearly a century. What have we learned? What have we learned from the Fry rule? I think we learned some interesting things from the Fry rule. Consensus in a field is a good indication of reliability. That was the idea behind it. That was the thought. If anybody knows whether this is good science, it's the people in the field. So let's see whether they agree that it's good science. Okay, let's see the reason we've done it. But it's not nearly as helpful as it looks. And the reason is, it seems, as you can me, it was obvious long before Justice Breyer said it, consensus in a weak or illegitimate field is absolutely no assurance of reliability. If the field's okay, consensus is a good indicator. But if the field is crap, then consensus is crap. As we in Florida know from the role of knife mark examinations in the Ramirez saga, let me tell you about Mr. Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez is convicted of capital murder three times on the basis of a knife mark examiner who says, sorry, I should have called a knife mark. I can identify this knife to the exclusion of every other knife in the world as the one that made the half-inch wound in, this, in the victim's neck. <laughs> really? Really? No. No, it can't be done. Um, a knife mark examiner can tell you the type of knife. You know, the size, the nature of the blade, the shape of the thing, perhaps something about the handle. But absent very specific characteristics which were not present in this case. Not the individual. No. Um, and under the Fry rule, all you had to 
concerned to get this, these land markings and the submitting boards, but there was agreement in the field that you could do this. Well, you're a knife mark examiner, you make your living by examining knives and giving criminal identifications. Are you going to say we can't do this? Of course not. So you pull together four, four guys, four knife mark examiners, and they say, yeah, there's consensus in the field, we can identify an individual knife. Yay. What we learned from the Dalbert trilogy, I think, first of all, we should have learned. Preoccupation with demarcating science and the preoccupation with methodology was just a big distraction. What we care about is reliability, and that's not the same as being scientific. And methodology soon became just a ubiquitous, completely empty term. Everybody's got methodology. Um, my favorite methodology of this is a philosophical technical term. It's a concertina concept. It can be broad or narrow depending on how we want it to play. Here is my absolutely favorite piece of methodology bullshit. The, the, the tire expert in Kumho Tire said, well, yeah, sure, I got methodology. What was that? Visual inspection methodology. That means the eyeball of the time. <laughs> okay. If that's a methodology, nothing fails to qualify as a methodology. By now, since the Supreme Court abandoned the methodology conclusions distinction, acknowledge that what matters is whether the testimony is reliable, not whether it's scientific. We realized there is no way to identify indicia of reliability applicable to any and every field of expertise. It can't be done. It can't be done. The experience we call appointed experts has been, well, let's just say, not very successful. The experience with Melinda's Diaz, I think, should have taught us. Not only that testifying every time might strain the forensic services, but should also have prompted us to remember 95%, up to 95% of criminal cases are pre -bound. They never go to trial. So nobody gets cross-examined. So however effective cross-examination may be, it's not going to touch the rest of the cases. I might think she's saying, oh, give up, it's hopeless. It is very difficult to run shit, but no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, what? We need to shift and broaden the focus. It's not one issue, it's a whole big tank of most of us. And I think we should be thinking more about how to reduce the incidence of the bad stuff getting to the court in the first place. That's better than having it appear, having to decide whether it's admissible, cross-examining it. We have to look outside the legal system. We have to look, for example, at how the forensic labs are run. Um, you know this story? You read about this strange creature? What a strange woman. I do not understand this woman at all. She was a technician in a drug testing lab in Boston. She worked there between 2009 and 2011. Oh, longer than that. Longer than that. I can't remember when she was first hired. But okay. She worked there for years. Finally, it was discovered that she was cooking samples. You know, sometimes she just wrote the report without actually doing the test. Sometimes when she was sure that there was cocaine in it, but the test showed that there wasn't, she threw some in to make sure it came up right. Uh, and as a result of what she did, something like 40,000 criminal cases in the Boston area are tainted, and there's still an argument about what to do. Do we retry them one by one, or do we, do, 
make some general decision of what do we do? It's a big mess. It's, it's what, the thing I don't understand about it is why. I also don't understand why nobody in the lab noticed. Wouldn't you think if one person in the lab can deal with five times as many samples in a day as anybody else who works there, something might be wrong? No, they just thought she was a really good employee. Um, I might say when the whole thing came out, it turned out she lied on her application form too. And nobody checked whether she actually had the degree that she claimed she did or she didn't. Don't understand her motivation. That's what's puzzling about it to me. Um, she wanted to be thought a good employee? Not really. I mean, what, what? Melendez Diaz was Dukan showed up in court a hundred and fifty times and was cross examined a hundred and fifty times. And her malfeasance never came out under cross examination. That's shocking. Probably these were grossly overworked public defenders doing the cross examination. But still, um, you're probably asking, how, so how did they uncover it? They found she took out some samples and didn't sign the right form. She took them the fridge and didn't sign the right form. That's how they caught her. She is, by the way, in prison. Does that thought extrapolate beyond forensics? Mm -hmm. Not in any simple way. The thought is, fix the forensic match, that's the place to start. Right. By the time it's got to court, um, you know, there are things we can do, but it would be better if we never happened in the first place. Much better if the labs were better run. Much better if everybody checked the information on the application forms. You simply don't hire anyone without checking they really do have the qualifications to play, for example. Does that thought extrapolate beyond forensics? Well, no, not in any simple way. Well, I do think, okay, I was thinking about the silicon breast implant, yes. After those two panels, Judge Pointers and Judge Jones's, the Institute of Medicine set up a panel to look at the evidence. It was a big old panel. And it was not involved in any litigation. It was just, okay, it's about time the Institute of Medicine Medicine figured out what's going on here. And they reached the same conclusion. There is no evidence that these implants cause the systemic tissue disorders that were alleged to. That was somewhat reassuring. Um, wouldn't it have been better before there were all those Brazilians of silicon breast in other cases? If that hadn't happened first, the Institute of Medicine could have stepped in before the legal system was up to hearing it, but didn't. Um, <laughs> of course it isn't. I don't believe there is a panacea. It's a big complicated problem. There is no simple one-shot solution. Um, but it's a plea for think more imaginatively about this. Don't just think about tinkering with the rules of evidence a bit or tinkering with your confrontation towards jurisprudence a little bit. Try to think outside the scope of the legal box because some of the solutions to some of these problems are going to be outside the legal system and not simply inside. I didn't know if I could squeeze this in, but I guess I just about did, but there's time for half a question. <laughs> we have some time okay. for a provocative question or two. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> was this too overwhelming? <laughs> well, exactly what you said. That's always a good question. Well, thank you. I think mean, <laughs> you've done a great job. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Hawker will stay for a few minutes if people want to quietly, individually, ask you something. Yeah, yeah, go to Big Book. This is a large and intimidating room. 
It is a bit daunting. Thank you again.